And so people will say these things to me and they'll say, Eric, you preach experience too much. And I bring it back to my black chair in my closet and I look up to the Lord and I say, they said it again, Lord, that I can't live by experience. And the Lord says the same thing to me every time. He switches the words around and he says, without experience, you don't live. In other words, I need a living Christ to live life. If he's alive, then he can be heard. If he's alive, then he can be seen. If he's alive, then he is perceptible. Listen closely. The spirit being given to you, the new life that gives you a faculty called the spirit that connects with God's spirit. This is all in the Bible, that you have a spirit that is connected with God's spirit. That implanted faculty is now the means by which God should govern your life. Does, does that make sense to you? If you try to hear me with your ears, you can do it. If you try to hear me with your eyes, you can't do it. It's the wrong faculty. Try your best to try to hear somebody with just your mouth. You, it's, it's the wrong faculty, it makes no sense. And in the same way, God has given to us a new faculty by which he can be perceived. But the problem is we have developed our physical senses so much and so neglected our spiritual senses that we mix the two. And that's why we've got to recognize that getting alone with God is where we learn the beauty of his perceptibility. You learn the secrets of the abiding place in the secret place. And as you go away into him alone, you learn what he feels like, what he, what he sent, you begin to sense him. And you can't even say that it's seeing or hearing because it's really neither because you're not really seeing or hearing. You're using something that we're trying to give language to and we say, I saw, I heard. We don't have any other language. It's a new faculty called the spirit that can see in a way and hear in a way and sense in a way. And this must be, this must be cultivated if we're gonna be led by the spirit. Those that are led by the spirit, these are the sons of God. And sonship with that verse is revealed to us that we need above all things to cultivate our perception of his person. Yeah. When I say perception, I don't mean perception like perspective. That's not what's being said. That's the first definition of the word. The second definition of the word is this, the ability to sense. So your perceptibility is the ability to sense him. It's the, receiving the ability to see or hear anything like this. So this new faculty that you have called your spirit man has got to be cultivated and it's cultivated in silence, in solitude, when no one else can see. Yes, you can cultivate it in degrees outward, but let me tell you like this. There are certain things I will only do with my wife when the doors are closed. And so it is with God. You can meet him out and about but you really don't get pregnant until you shut the door. Are you listening to me? And the public touch has got to turn into a private kiss or it will all fade away. Listen, there are whole movements that are based upon parts of him and forget the living interaction with him. Nobody gets pregnant holding hands, as you've heard it said. Nobody gets pregnant holding hands, meaning you can't just skip along in life with Jesus and skip the closet. It doesn't work that way. We've got to shut the door and get alone. You know what else? Nobody gets pregnant by telling themselves that they're pregnant but we've got whole, quote, identity movements. I'm not against identity, but when, when identity becomes hyper is when it has taken the place of the secret place. When it becomes so positional, it's no longer personal. Identity begin, be, becomes a problem 
when we're looking at ourselves in the mirror trying to tell ourselves we're pregnant while we won't go into the closet and get pregnant. Come on. But you've got all kinds of people telling them, just look at yourself and tell yourself who you are. Tell yourself who you are. No, 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 no. I don't want to know who I am. I want to know him. I want to see him. I want to perceive him. I want to be blinded by his realities, even to the point where I can say like Paul, not I live, not the old Paul or the new Paul, but Christ lives in me. I'm so blinded. True identity in Christ looks like this, looking at Jesus. Identity in Christ is never looking at you. Identity in Christ is being blinded by the Son of God. See, there's a book called What to Expect When Expecting. Has anybody ever heard of it? When we were about to have our first kid, my wife gave me that 600-page and pound (laughs) book and said, you know, you should read some of this. But you know what I mean? You can read What to Expect When Expecting and memorize it. It's not going to get you pregnant. You could put it in a blender and eat it. It's not going to get you pregnant. Pregnant. It's, you, what to expect when expecting is only words. But so many people have taken this Bible and thought that if they memorize it, that they'll get pregnant. You can't replace the living Christ with a book. He's meant to come through the book. Scriptures are the straw through which you drink the Word of God. There's a difference. Mental weight cannot crack this book open for you. It will never crack by the weight of men's mentalities, mindsets, commentaries, or expositions. will never crack this book open for you so you can hear the living voice. It's not going to happen. But the weight of his presence is heavy enough to crack the outer shell of the scriptures for the living voice to come out and be life to you. We need the presence of God to make this book live. It's like a bunch of people walking around with a cookbook, talking about recipes and showing each other pictures of different plates and appetizers and things like this. Hey, look, you see my new recipe? I got this, I add some butter in there. And that's how they live, just talking about recipes. But the presence will turn this book of recipes into a delectable spread to be eaten so that you can receive him. Nobody gets pregnant by commitment alone. Otherwise, my wife would have been pregnant when I put a ring on her finger. It's not that way. You still have to have intimate experience of the person. In the same way, you have, whole, you have people thinking because they're committed. Because they've said, you know what? I'm going to obey God from here on out. Listen, religion can't save. Your commitment can't save you. Only the living Christ, known, experienced, heard. The Bible doesn't say that this is eternal life, to be committed to God. Is commitment part of it? Obviously, but there's something so much deeper than just saying or professing a commitment and trying to keep it. Eternal life is to know him, to walk with him, to drink him, to eat him. You know what else? You can know all the ways to become pregnant and still not become pregnant. In other words, you can teach people about prayer and you yourself not be communing with God. You can know all kinds of secrets and read Andrew Murray like I love to do so much and memorize methods of prayer and all kinds of things and be able to teach them perfectly. You can stand up here like I am right now and say the things I'm saying right now and still not walk with God. The truth of the matter is when you shut that door, that's who you really are. Anybody can fool people in the assembly. It's so easy. And this is not a rebuke. Let's just talk. I'm just trying to talk about the heart of the matter because that's all that God cares about anyways. I'm saying that because in the public place, people will perceive one thing. But once when, when nobody can see, that's what God's looking at. <laughs> Do you remember what was said about David? It says that man looks at the outward appearance, but God, he looks at the heart. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? 
God looks right past all the stuff that comes out of our mouths. He looks past all the things that we present to people. And let me just tell you, your reputation with God is not found in your presentation to men. Never has been and never will be. Your reputation with God is forged and found. I shouldn't say forged. Your reputation with God is found behind closed doors in the intimate holdings and sweet nothingness of exchange and blissful reception of his person. That's the real deal. And I know you guys know this. Obviously, by the way you guys are in here and the atmosphere that's in here, it's, it's obvious you guys are walking with God. So I say these things to encourage you in the same. To say, this is the way, let's walk in it. Let's not let anything get in the way, anything come before. Anything at all cause us to overthink. There's a phrase that went around in the Toronto Blessing, which I love it, I say it to myself. The phrase was, less thinking, more drinking. <laughs> less thinking, more drinking. Drinking, drinking, drinking. Drinking. You know what I mean. Just this. No other agenda, just him. Your itch to move on stems from a desire for something other than just him. But to linger, to drink and linger, whew, that's what turns grape juice into wine. You know, there's a major difference between a Capri Sun walking around and a bottle of aged wine. It's a major difference. You can drink 100 Capri Suns, you'd probably get a stomach ache, but you won't get drunk. You take a bottle of aged wine, it's high proof you're going to get, you're probably going to get plastered. What am I saying that for? There's an influence of the spirit that comes to those who ferment. They take time to be with him in his presence. See, fermentation is the process in which the sugars, the sweetness turns to alcohol. And the spirit wants to take the sweetness that he's put on each one of your lives into time with him so that that sweetness that's on you will ferment to an influence of him upon you so that now you walk underneath his influence. Drinking, drinking, drinking. Madame Guyon said this. This is one of my favorite prayer analogies of all because it just really hits the heart of the issue. She said, when the infant is upon the breast, it moves its lips to get the milk to start flowing. Then once the milk starts to flow, it stops and simply receives the milk. Oh, that's awesome. Then she goes on and says, and if ever the milk should wane, it moves its lips again to get the milk to flow and stops to simply receive the milk. You see, the smoldering fire needs just a little bit of air. If you keep pressing, you'll blow it out. You've got to stop right when he begins to move and then you, you receive because it's all about the perception of his person. That's what prayer really is. It's perceiving his person. Far more than words could ever accomplish. Being held by him will meet more issues in your soul than a million prayers could ever do it. And once you touch his presence, you find out he was all you ever needed anyways, and 95% of your prayers vanish anyways. Because you find that he was everything. What does this analogy look like that she was talking about? Well, you move your lips. That's worship. I worship you. I give you glory and honor. There's nobody like you. You begin to sense the sweetness of his presence, and you stop this is the accomplishing of the purpose right here. I worship you. Then your mind begins to stray. You say, I give you glory. There's nobody like you. I worship. And you're holding it. You're literally just holding this sweet sense of his person and letting him hold you. How do you let God hold you? By holding the sweet sense of his person.
Some days will be harder than others based upon the scatteredness of your mind. Listen. The experience of God is so rare because scattered minds are so common. But if our hearts will get still and just gaze upon him and hold the sweet reception of his person, we'll not only receive him and be held by him, but at the same time, you'll be freed from the need to have anything else, which is the true platform of rest and leading. This is where God can really lead you and you're not led by your own desires disguised and stamped with God's name. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You have your own desires, you start praying your own desires and you just stamp at the end, in Jesus' name. But the reality is, is let all those things get evaporated by the sweetness of his presence and then let him lead you. Leading comes out of rest, the platform of rest. There's one more thing I, I felt, you'll also check this out. The baby never asks the mother for a chemical analysis of the milk. Are there any carbs in this before I drink it? They don't, they don't do that, they just receive. Yeah. But here's a lot of Christians have gotten like that. They're about to drink the milk and then they start thinking. Are there carbs in this milk? Is, uh, wait a second, mom. What's really going on here? Start thinking. Less thinking, more drinking. Because in the drinking, you get illuminated by the uncreated light instead of settling for sight by a created light. I don't want to condescend to mere brilliance when I can have the word of the Lord. Do you know what I mean? I don't want to condescend to brilliance, intellectual brilliance, when I can have the living word. The living word far exceeds intellectual brilliance because it comes down from heaven. The, uh, God cannot be completely understood, but he can be received. God cannot be completely explained, but he can be enjoyed. And if we'll stop right there and recognize, I can enjoy him, I can receive him, and I'm gonna give myself to that, then we will develop spiritually instead of getting caught up and wearied by trying to figure him out and make him make sense to us. The last thing I felt to share is uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29. The scripture says that there are things that God has revealed to men and there are things that are secrets that he has not revealed to men. It says the secret things of the Lord, they belong to the Lord. Do you remember this scripture? Now this shows us two things, that there are things God wants to show us and there are things he does not want to show us. I'm saying this because I felt from the Lord to... Just encourage people not to try to pry into things God has not yet spoken. Do not take a crowbar and try to pry into things that God has set for the secrets that are kept for himself. What happens is when we try to pry into the things that God has kept secret for himself, the things that he has not revealed, we try to pry into them, our mind and everything begins to break down. You know what that breakdown looks like? Pride and arrogance. The mind becomes so proud and arrogant when it starts prying into the things that God has not yet revealed. It's better to remain like a child and say, I don't know for certain things, but I do know this. I can drink him and I can eat him and he becomes life to me. Isn't that beautiful? It's very important, I think, these things because I've seen so many people come to me and they have this question. I can't experience God. I get alone and I... I'm in there and I don't, I don't experience anything. I never sense anything. And I just, man, that breaks my heart. Because what being born again is, is receiving the ability to perceive God. Your, the inability per, to perceive God is your damnable state. The damnable state that you were in before he saved you was the inability to perceive God. Now the new state that he's brought you into through the blood and faith in the cross is a state of being in which you can perceive him. That's the difference between the two worlds. But what happens is, is people take their lack of experience, which is really because of their minds, and they won't simply receive, and they make a theology of it, and they blend the two. 
They're like, well, you can't really tell if you're born again or not. You don't really know. I mean, you just, you're just different, I guess. No, no, no. Eternal life is not a change of life. It's an exchange of life. It's a two, it's a two different worlds, man. Two different worlds. So I wanted to encourage people. Let's choose childlikeness. And I'll end with a quote by Andrew Murray because we're going to close out here. And what I would like to do is just say a couple things at the end after I say this. I'll say a couple of things that I want to let you guys know about. And then I'd love to pray collectively for everybody if that's okay. I believe that God has sent me here for two reasons. To bring about an increase in simplicity and ease in every life that hears these words. So I'm going to pray that God would release grace and oil for simplicity and ease. That you would simply find him and easily enjoy him. Okay? Andrew Murray said this. The true beauty. Actually, I want you to say it with me. Say this. The true beauty beauty. of childlikeness childlikeness. is the absence of self-consciousness. Goodness gracious, guys. Where did that statement come from? That came from drinking. That came from Andrew Murray in his closet drinking the lamb. And he heard it. And he wrote it down. (laughs) The true beauty of childlikeness. The child is the one who receives the kingdom. The child is the one who receives what he asks for. The child is the one that Jesus said, unless you become like him, you'll never find the glories of the kingdom. David Hogan's vision of the, the box. You guys remember that? Is, did anybody hear that, that story? I'll tell it to you real quick. There's a bull in a field trying to, with force, open up a little package. And he can't with all of his fighting and mustering up and sound and noise, all this. And a little baby comes and just easily throws the top of the box off and accesses the things inside. The difference between the two is all the efforts in the world will never do what one ounce of childlikeness will do. What is childlikeness? The true beauty of childlikeness is the absence of self-consciousness. Gaze upon him. Everything in your life is trying to get you to stop looking at him. I go through it all day long, every day. Where are my eyes? I fail and I win. I win and I fail, but I can lay on him. I have times where it's easier, times where it's more difficult, but the reality is, is he is never different. He is always 100% willing and wanting to hold me. And if you've ever touched him, you know this. The only thing he's interested in doing is holding you anyways. Whatever state you're in, he just wants to hold you. Can I tell you one last story and then I'll close up? Is that right? One time I went on a road trip with a man of God. Man, some of you may have heard this if you've ever heard me say anything because it's really changed my life. And I get into this car and the older man of God looks at me and he says, let's pray. And so I did the only thing that I knew to do at that time in my life and I started just spitting out in tongues, machine gunning God and hell and everything. I was just, shut up, oh God, do something, God, we pray. Lord. Just praying with every, I'm sweating, I'm shaking, I'm tired. After he waited for me to finish my whole all-out assault on God and hell and the smoke to clear from all this effort and striving. And when I was tired and I stopped praying because I was done, I didn't want to do it anymore. With a steaming coffee in one hand and the steering wheel in the other, he went like this. Jesus, I worship you. I give you glory, Lord. There's no one like you. And the presence of the Lord flooded the car in an undeniable way. I was mixed with two feelings. One of me, part of me was tearing up because of the sweetness of the lamb. The other part of me was very angry because of how easily he touched God. And I learned a very valuable lesson that day, and that lesson is this, that one ounce of adoration is worth tons and tons of efforts. And the secret to all of Christianity can be summed up in this one phrase. Snuggle, don't struggle. (laughs) Snuggle, don't struggle. You'll know this. If you're struggling, you're not snuggling. 
And if you're snuggling, you'll never struggle. Are you saying there's not going to be bumps in the road? Absolutely not. Are you saying there's not going to be difficulties and failures and weaknesses and disrespect and dishonor or lack or any? Are you saying that? No, absolutely not. But what I am saying is that your joy and your peace have nothing to do with anything that's happening to you because you can run into the name of the Lord. The name of the Lord is a strong tower and the righteous run into it and they're safe. That the Lord is a refuge for us. He's actually called by David a pavilion. You can run into him. No matter what's going on, no matter how difficult it is, no matter if everything is falling down around you, he is always right there to hold you and bliss your soul and make it numb to unbelief, doubt, and reason, and fear. Oof, that's what bliss does. The sweet bliss of his presence, it numbs you to unbelief. And doubt and fears, frustrations and competitions, and it doesn't even matter no more. How, how many of you have ever came in with a whole bunch of stuff to say to God? You start worshiping, and all of a sudden you forgot everything you were going to do. Yeah, and how many of you the other way was around? You came in there to really spend time with God, but all you did was talk to Him about stuff, and you leave the same way you came in. Listen, you go in and you come out the same way that you came in when you do everything but adore Him. But adoration will open up the receptivity of the soul, and then you just hold it. And as you begin to perceive him, then he can take you wherever he wishes. And this book right here will come alive. This is the only book that demands the author be present when it's read. That's what the presence does. Yeah, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. I'm going to pray for you right now. Is that okay? Yeah, just put your hand like right here on your chest. That's where I feel most burnings, the sweet, sweet presence. Oh, how I bless your name, Jesus. Oh, how I glorify your name. No eyes like your eyes, no face can do to me what your face does to me. Oh, how I long for you. Oh, how I glorify you, Lord. She na 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 ya 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 ya. Oh, I worship you. Oh, I glorify your name. You are lovely to me. Jesus, right now I just release over you ease. Yeah. It's so easy. So easy. His yoke is easy. His yoke is easy. And his burden is light. Nay, 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 nay. Yep. And I release over you simplicity right now. Simplicity. So oil of simplicity. Protection from complexity. Oh, yes, oh, yes, oh, yes. Simplicity and ease.